Welcome back to the channel. In today's interview, I sit down with Cornell University professor Paul Finneves. We're going to talk about three things, and I want you to stick through it. The first thing we're going to talk about is pandemic amnesty or accountability, which is right. Emily Oster wrote the former. I wrote the latter. Paul comes in and he tries to offer a solution that might make everyone happy. Next, we talk about Paxlovid. We talk about the unknown risks of therapeutics. How does Paul think about this? And finally, we talk about a very contentious subject, vaccine mandates. As you all know, I was one of the few people who over and over and over again in op-eds in 2021, I said, you do not want passports, you do not want mandates, certainly not in America. Paul initially felt differently, but right now he's come around to being against any and all mandates for boosters in perpetuity. I think it's important that we talk to somebody who we might have initially disagreed with, but now we see eye to eye, to get to hear how he thought about this over time and why his thinking evolved. So don't tune him off, turn him off, don't tune him away. Listen to what he has to say because he might actually make some points by the end of it you're going to like a great deal. So that's the order of this interview. Stay tuned. I'm back in plenary session, virtual edition. I'm joined by Dr. Paul Finneves. Dr. Finneves is a practicing internist at Weill Cornell Medical Center, and he's the author of two recent Substack posts that both appeared on Sensible Medicine. One is about, in the face of changing facts in the COVID-19 pandemic, he changed his views on vaccine mandates. And the second is about when we prescribe drugs or take part in therapies or strategies that we don't know there's a benefit, we should be more cognizant about potential harms down the road. So Dr. Fenives, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, let's let's talk about these interesting COVID-19 right. issues. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Vinay. I really appreciate it. So I'm a big fan of yours because I think you're a nuanced, centrist thinker. And let's yeah. give the disclosure to the audience because he's going to be a centrist. And I think that's important because we need people who are rational centrists. Now, I wonder if you might just take a moment to tell listeners a little bit about your background. What's your day-to-day -day job like? Um, and how did you, so how do you, you know, what's the lens through which you approach COVID policy questions? So uh, primarily I'm a practicing internal medicine doctor. So I've got uh, a busy clinical practice. I've been in practice for close to 15 years now. I've been here at Wild Cornell for 11 years, so I've got a full clinical practice. Um, over the last couple of years, I've taken on some admin roles. I'm the site medical director for uh, my clinic, um, and then I'm also, uh, I've got a role in digital health. So I helped get our uh, our video visit, our telemedicine program up and running, and uh, and I have a role related to trying to get technology working in primary care uh, uh, in interesting ways. Digital health, general internal medicine, you see the big picture of healthcare. Is that fair to say? Uh, definitely. I've got a very generalist approach and, you know, I'm probably 75% clinical. So really I'm, I'm just, you know, a boots on the ground internal medicine doc here in New York city. I hundred percent. I, I feel like that's actually a good seg segue into yes. this, this article uh, yes. from Emily Oster, which was fascinating. Uh, let's talk Pandemic about that. amnesty because I, I, I think that this is, um, uh, you know, a really important topic because this is obviously the pandemic is going to be one of the biggest topics of public conversation in economics and medicine and life for, for years to come. And, and, um, and, and I actually, I, I think she wrote, uh, a really important article, uh, about that, about the discussion to be had. And so, um, so yeah, so I was, so give me a second, let me, let me offer you up my take on this. Yes. And, and, and you'll let me know what you think. Cause yes. so, you know, so she writes this article for, for those who haven't read it, basically saying that we, you know, we should have a, a pandemic amnesty. So people made bad decisions, wrong decisions in the heat of the moment with imperfect information, even with, uh, even sort of ignoring good information, but it, it was well-intentioned and it was, uh, and it was a pandemic. It was, it was a crazy time and we made mistakes and um, and and so we should allow people to move past this and we should be able to have dialogue with people without recriminating them for their decisions. And uh, Emily Oster, if I'm paraphrasing your article poorly, I apologize. It was very well written. So it's and it's a short piece. It's an easy read. Yeah. And so and so I that, think that's right. Yeah. So that dropped. And then there was uh, uh, on Twitter, there was a really big reaction basically saying, um, no, this is wrong. We don't need pandemic amnesty. We need pandemic accountability. That's my and, article. <laughs> go on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, you know, so, yeah, yeah. so I actually, this is, this is why I want to bring it up because I'm trying, yeah. this, is, this is me being a centrist, but I want, yes. I want to harmonize these two ideas and tell me, tell me what you think about this. Cause I think, I think both are true. 
And I think the distinction is, the distinction is policymakers and the public, right? And, and when I talk about the public, I mean, I mean, pundits, I mean, experts, I mean, everybody, even people who were, you know, tweeting up a storm for their beloved policy, if they were wrong, but they were not the, the, the makers of the policy, I think they should get a pass. I think we should be graceful and forgiving. And the reason is, it's really, it's really hard to change your mind. I mean, you, you come up with an idea and you become identified with that idea very quickly. So, so just thinking something, it's hard to change your mind. And then maybe you, you said that idea to your spouse, makes it harder. Maybe you tweeted that idea, makes it even harder. Maybe you wrote a big article about it, harder still. So changing your mind, is it, it comes at a great cost, but ultimately we want, there's gonna be the, the zealots, the extremists who are never going to leave their camp, but there's a great number of people in the middle like me who with, with good arguments can be convinced. And it's important that we convince people of the right policy decisions so that we can do a good M and M on 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 COVID. So so to me, that's the public. Yeah. Policymakers is a different story. I think right. policymakers should be held to account. And I think, for me, it's less about the individual decisions, but it's more about general policy con, uh, concepts. So I would say, number one, constraining the debate was never right. Right. Like right. so, Francis Collins saying that we're going to do a takedown of Jay Bhattacharya's Great Barrington Declaration. That was never right. You know. In this moment of the pandemic, we decided to take a pivot towards more of a, mo a model like China, more of sort of a top-down tyrannical type model. But that's not us, you know. And and in the midst of the pandemic, we should have doubled down on on being America, double down on public dialogue, double down on freedom of speech, and we should have come to the right policy collectively, right? And and I and I really think that I I don't agree necessarily with with the Great Barrington Declaration, but some of that thinking could have influenced things tremendously. Like, so even with the first Pfizer trial, maybe if Bhattacharya was a voice in the room, that trial would have been in the highest risk individuals. It would have been a trial of only 70 and up. Right. And uh, and the end point would have been hospitalization. Mortality or hospitalization. Or mortality, right. right? Yeah. Right. Maybe that's the right answer. And I'm not, listen, and I'm not would, a and would, developer to yeah. argue that that was right. I'm just saying that those are the sorts of thoughts that could have been part of the conversation if the conversation was more ample. So I feel like constraining the debate was totally wrong and there should be accountability for that. I think number two, failure to obtain data, you know, no public RCTs for uh, masking, school ventilation, all this stuff right. it was a total fail, a total right. failure. And I think you made this point, and I think this is huge about this, this New England Journal of Medicine masking study that just came out, which is that with observational studies, You've got the pro-maskers with the pro-masking observational studies. You got the anti-maskers with the anti-masking observational studies. It's because you can slice the salami however you want, and you can come up with the study that fits your priors. And and a randomized uh, control trial doesn't allow that as much. In fact, in my you know my my uh, fantasy for this would be you get you know the most pro-mask guy and you get the most anti-mask gal and you get them together in a room and they agree on the on the trial. Right. They come up with the trial together and the trial is run and whatever the outcome is, we agree that that's the outcome. And, you know, so so using these trials as a way to adjudicate truth, it's not just that they're the best way to find truth. But if it's a well done trial that people believe in the methods that um, people are going to accept the conclusions instead of just brandishing the opposite tr observational trial that shows the exact opposite conclusion. So I think that's number two. And then number three, I think mandates is a big Thing to talk about. I think we need to articulate a standard of when a mandate is appropriate and also by whom. And like you said, I don't think that a mandate should ever come from some business or school or small entity, all these summer camps that were mandating vaccines. Right. The, the time frame and the, um, you, you, you know, a summer camp mandating a vaccine, they will maximize <clears throat> anything that for the short term reduces COVID spread even if there's long-term harm. I'm not saying there's long-term harm. I'm just saying that their incentive structure is wrong. Um, and, and you can't leave it to just small organizations to form these mandates. So so that's those are my pandemic amnesty thoughts. And I'll, I'll, I'll shut up for a second. No, you've, uh, you've, you've, you've hit me. You hit me hard because that's pretty much my position uh, as exactly as yours for exactly the same reasons you've articulated. One, I think that actually in some ways social media is bad because we need to be able to forget to move forward. We need to forget you believed 
whatever you may have believed. I know yeah. people who in 2008, I don't think they supported gay marriage, but I think they changed their way by 2015. We need yes. to allow them to forget who they were yes. so we can yes. make progress, you know? Yes. And so I totally agree with you. The average person out there, I forgive them. I totally agree with you. It's the people who made the decisions that need to be held to account. And I agree with you on all the three themes, you know? And I think I've written on some of these things, themes too, which is Fauci and Collins, what hurt me the most is that at a time where you're making the most unprecedented policy decisions, you want the biggest debate. You don't yes. want the, yeah, you know, it's the most uncertain. Of course, one thing that we could have learned from Jay, in addition to what you mentioned, schools might have been kept open if we had listened to them. Yes. Yes. You know, so it's wrong to throw Jay out. And it's, it's, it, it's one thing to, not only did they throw him out, they made it seem like Jay and Martin are in like the pocket of the Koch brothers and they're doing it for secondary gain. And I'm like, look, you know, they're not doing it for secondary gain. They just believe something different than you. Just yeah. like you believe what you believe for whatever reasons you believe it. They're just the same. They believe and they're true believers and you're true believers. So why do we have to assume um, there is a place for conflict? It's a big problem in our field. This isn't it. The fate of the yes. world isn't the conflict. And then you know, the mask RCT, that was what I banged on about. No one said more. <laughs> yes. Do the RCT. Do the, you know, because that's the way you settle it. So 100%. Yes. Um, I think that's the way you, you solve it. And accountability to me, and I always focus the way you focus, it should be on the institutions and the people who are at the top. So yes. Fauci, I think, can be held to account. Ja, Morthy, et cetera. The FDA, Marks. Um, random Twitter account, 52. You know, let them mm -hmm. slide. Yeah. Yes. So talk about the last thing, you know, it's, um, this last thing is so brilliant because you articulated something that, you know, I know Adam Seafood, he texted me saying that was a brilliant piece and I got other people texting me. You articulated something that doctors have always felt. We don't put into words. We're not good at putting it into words, but it's like, it's that thing that people say, oh, you know, if you're super low risk and epic HR, Paxlovid's randomized trial doesn't apply to you, the worst thing that could happen is it's a small effect. But that's not true. That's not the worst thing that could happen. So talk about this. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm a big believer. Uh, so, so just saying as a primary care doctor, um, I have a lot of very high level heuristics, algorithms for how I think about things, you know, um, because I encounter a big variety of stuff. And so one of these algorithms that I've always used is you, you don't get something for nothing. That every intervention, every intervention carries some risk of harm or potential harm. And sometimes you know those harms and sometimes you have no idea what those harms will be. And some of those harms will be uh, discovered and some of those harms will, will, will never be known. And, um, and because you are always assuming a harm with any intervention, um, you have to be pretty damn sure that you're getting uh, a good benefit, right? And, um, and so anytime you offer something to a patient you really want to be sure you're doing them good because, you know, I believe in a very strong version of do no harm. You know, this is, you know, the, one of the, the primary principles in medicine, do no harm. And, and for me, do no harm doesn't just mean that you should not harm your patients. It's, a, it's an acknowledgement of a fundamental thing about our bodies that have evolved over millions of years, which is that it's easier to hurt somebody than to help somebody, right? So it's, 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 it's not very easy to improve somebody. Uh, it's very easy to, to make them a little sicker. And so, um, you know, because of that, if you don't know that you're helping somebody, you have to assume you might be hurting somebody with any intervention, be it a medication, be it a vaccine, be it anything. And, um, and so you really should be cognizant of this. Um, and, and, you know, I think doctors uh, are often very ready to, to give something as a solution. We'll offer up, here's a medication, just try this because we feel like we have to do something. And, um, and and sometimes that's valid because we're probably offering placebo. Um, so I'm not saying that's a totally uh, invalid thing that I never do, but, um, but, I, but, I, but I do think that uh, there's not enough uh, realization in the general public and, and just in our culture of medicine that, that, that all interventions have this carry this balance, this trade-off. I, you know, you're taking the words out of my mouth. I always say the same thing you say. And, and, and t let's talk about the two places where I think it matters. You know, um, I agree. I think it matters in the COVID pandemic when it comes to vaccinating kids who are five years old. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if a kid is five years old, especially now that 86% have uh, anti-nuclear capsid antibodies, you know, per the CDC, um, you got to leave it up to parents to decide if they want to vaccinate their own kid. There is a potential upside. It is not out of 
question that it could further lower the risk of severe disease. Although I think the upper bound absolute risk reduction has got to be, you know, as close to as clo as small as it gets. Um, but, you know, there's also some potential downside. And we have to admit what we don't know, which is we don't know what the effects might be five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. And so to go into that with coercion or pressure, to not acknowledge there are things you don't know, that to me is a space where we can, you know, and that's different than an 85-year-old where, yes. you know, 85-year-old and we're talking December 2021. And I know the risk of COVID death is one in four, one in five. If you get COVID and yes. you got a vaccine with a symptom, yeah. I say, you know what? There are unknown unknowns, but sh you get it, you know, get it quick, yeah. get it yeah. quick, man. This yes. one thing, you know, the known yeah. knowns are bigger. Um, yes. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, that's just a basic yeah. corollary that you, it's a basic you have corollary. to match, bit, you, you, you match the benefit to the risk. If the benefit is huge, you'll, you should take on big risk. And if the benefit is small, you should take on small risk. Yeah, and then the second place, I think it's the use of, you know, it's so interesting to me, the left-right debate. I mean, I've always been a critic of hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin and, and mm -hmm. TPA and all that. You yes. know, I, I wrote an article on the, you know, uh, uh, this kitchen sink approach, just throwing yes. things at it. And I still am skeptic of that. But, and, and my friends on the political left are a skeptic of that. But my friends on the political left are a big believer in almighty Paxlovid, almighty yes. Molnupiravir, and almighty Remdesivir. Yes. And, and I'm like, why are you, where's the data for this? Um, it, there is data in very narrow populations. People who are unvaccinated and at high risk of hospitalization. And not the 22-year-old person I know at Facebook who just took Paxlovid. There's yes. no data for that person who's gotten four doses. I mean, what is yeah. this? So thoughts on the Paxlovid? Yeah, you know, um, uh, to me, it's it's incredible. So uh, I actually, I'd, I'd written an article about Paxlovid and the dearth of data uh, that was put out in Stat Opinion First. And um, you know, basically, I was reading uh, that excellent book, Sickening, by John Abramson, and um, this was at the time that Paxlovid came out. And in the book, he recounts, you know, the sordid affair that was Tamiflu. And so I'm reading this and I had a thought, which about a hundred people had the same thought all over the world, the same time as me, but I had a thought that, well, this is the story of Tamiflu that he's telling in this book is the story of Paxlovid right now. Yes. Um, and uh, and so I wrote an article about that, which, which he graciously edited, which is incredible. He's an incredibly uh, generous person. Um, but um, but it is it is unbelievable that uh, this medication was uh, taken up and and you know and and bought by the government at an expensive price to the taxpayers, and um, and we're not demanding better data. I mean that's what's what's unbelievable is that you know the the, the government is sort of making a buy on our behalf. You know it's like you know it's it's like it's like your father buys a car for you but didn't even take it for a test drive. You're like you know. Come on, this is my money, you know, yeah. get get me my money's worth, you know, make sure and, that I'm getting my money's worth. And they bought it even before the Epic HR press release. I mean, what are they doing? They spent, yes. they, they already committed to 5 billion outlay. And, and that to me is bad because now they're anchored to proving it works. And it goes back to that. So now what do we have for Paxlovid? Yes. We have observational studies. And guess yes. what? The observational studies, Ashish Jha is happy to tweet whichever one supports whatever he's saying. And the people who've been tweeting the change.org petition to mask in school, they're happy to come up with the observational study that shows their change.org petition from two years ago was correct. And the people who had the change.org petition said, don't mask those kids. They can come up with their observational study that shows don't mask those kids. And the same for lockdown and the same for school, you know, all these things. And yes. where's the truth? The truth is gone. It's just, yes. and that's what saddens me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's w without having reliable data, there is no way to adjudicate this truth and solve these problems. And so, uh, you know, everything just becomes, you know, people's priors uh, being uh, uh, confirmed by their own biased intervention, uh, by, by their own biased trials. You know, I think... You know, we covered a bunch of topics so marvelously. And and I think what comes across to me is that the kind of philosophical approach you have to medicine, I think, is something that I really share. And I think, like, what are the core principles, if I were to articulate what the principles are? The principles are, it's okay to do things when there's uncertainty and severe risk, but at the same time, we should do things to reduce that uncertainty. We can't just mm -hmm. implement stuff and then not try to test it or figure it out. Yes. Um, if somebody's at high risk for something, it's okay to take a gamble. It's okay to give it a shot. 
But if yes. somebody's at ultra low risk of something, then maybe mm -hmm. prudence and avoidance is the is the best thing to do. Um, and we need to let people be forgiven who weren't the power players. Yes. Um, and we need to focus on the people who, and the institutions actually that permitted them to, to hold that power. I really agree with all of that. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. One of the things you said to me was, um, that, that still strikes me is like that, uh, that idea that we, we showed that when we were scared, we could easily succumb to authoritarianism, which that to me is a, a very dangerous. I didn't, I didn't think America could get there. Um, but I think I've seen glimpses of what it could do. If you really scare someone and make them really be fearful, you can, you can get away with a lot. Um, and that to me is a dangerous current because mm -hmm. you can scare someone for something real and you can scare someone for something that's not real. And, you know, COVID-19 was a major uh, threat. It killed a million people more. It was horrible. Um, but you never know what's the next thing they're going to get scared about that uh, may not be as big a threat. And, uh, and we'll see what the impact is. So let's talk about the first article. I really like this article. Now, um, there's two parts to this question. One part to the question is, I think it's fair to say that between December or January, well, one thing I want to start by saying, the randomized controlled trials that brought the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines to the US market, the primary endpoint was symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. It wasn't severe disease, nor was it the ability to transmit. In fact, the study could have been designed with a lot of blinded swabbing, so we would have some idea about transmission, but it wasn't designed that way. It is the way it is. I mean, it was designed with symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. People lament that. I think that's actually quite reasonable in the heat of a pandemic to design it against the primary endpoint of a symptomatic infection. I don't have a qualm with that. From the debut of the virus, January 2021, until Provincetown, I think most people, many people believed, and it might have even been the case against the prevailing strains, that the vaccine not only was good at protecting you against severe disease, it was also really good at preventing other people from getting COVID because you've been vaccinated. So I think that was a reasonable belief. That is an important belief because it's a prerequisite for, I don't think it necessarily means you have to, but it is a prerequisite for the ability to mandate. Uh, Provincetown comes and you see you know, hundreds of uh, mostly uh, gay men who uh, contracted COVID-19 who had been vaccinated. And I think some of those thinking, you know, went out the window and we thought that this vaccine is not going to be able to halt transmission. So during this time, your feelings about vaccine mandates evolved. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about that. Um, a hundred percent. So I, uh, I was initially supportive of vaccine mandates for COVID-19. Um, the first place where I encountered vaccine mandates were of course, in, in the healthcare setting, right? And uh, healthcare here on the East Coast was much earlier to mandate the vaccines than uh, in other places, uh, which is understandable. Um, you know, we, we really saw the brunt of the pandemic early on in the spring of 2020. And, um, you know, uh, when the vaccine first came out, I, uh, you know, I was a primary care doctor who was working. I was seeing COVID patients throughout that whole surge. I, you know, we, we, did a flip to video visits, but we never stopped seeing patients in person. I never stopped coming into the office to see COVID patients. Um, but, um, you know, I, I definitely had sort of a duty uh, mentality towards the vaccine in that uh, by that point, I had felt pretty comfortable having for months treated COVID patients, not having contracted COVID and being relatively young and a healthy person that I was not at high risk. But I, I did have sort of this um, sort of duty-like uh, approach to, to being one of the first, first people to get the vaccine. So I really thought it was important for, uh, for doctors and nurses and healthcare providers to be out front and center to get the vaccine, not just to protect themselves, but just to demonstrate to the public that, um, that this is a safe vaccine and this is going to be a viable way to get us out of the pandemic. Um, and uh, yeah, I, you know, early on there was a lot of, you know, metaphors about COVID being like, uh, you know, like a war, and you know, sort of all of these warlike metaphors. And so I felt like, you know, within that framework, I, you know, I was a soldier, and I should have stepped up to get the vaccine. And um, and I definitely felt the same about my uh, my healthcare colleagues. And this is where I first encountered the vaccine. And I, I you know, I, I don't have the sort of uh, deep way to appraise the medical literature that, that you do. I've got a much more of a high level primary care uh, standpoint, but I definitely felt that 
to me, the, there seem to be, particularly for healthcare providers uh, and healthcare workers, sufficient suggestion that this vaccine was not just going to protect ourselves, that it was also going to reduce transmission and protect our patients, that I thought it was a reasonable ask uh, that healthcare workers go ahead and get this vaccine. Now, I, you know, even from the beginning, and I guess this is why I was the sort of person who wrote the essay that uh, that I sent to your Substack. You know, even from the beginning, I was turned off by some of the things about the vaccine mandate. So, I always thought that um, by the time the vaccine came out, we had a good sense that post-infectious immunity was very robust, and that should have always been an exclusionary for getting the vaccine. You That's know, right. there was a lot yeah. of people that argued, "Oh, but we don't know how long." post-infectious immunity was going to last. And of course, the, the rejoinder to that is, well, we don't know how long post-vaccine immunity is going to last. Right. So it seemed um, like there was enough data uh, and enough hesitancy among uh, patients and even uh, healthcare workers uh, regarding the vaccine. So there's enough data that if they had already had COVID, that they were no longer a risk. And I never thought that it made sense to push hard on those individuals. Individuals who said, I don't want it. I had COVID. I feel like I'm protected. I think that that was uh, never the person to push on. And, and I'm also, I'm just, you know, like you said, I'm a centrist. I'm not, uh, I'm not a zealot. And I encountered, um, a lot of vaccine zealotry, which really, uh, gave me pause. So, um, so I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you an anecdote. Yeah. And this is, this is a HIPAA compliant anecdote. I thought I might tell the story. So I asked the patient and they said, this is fine. So, uh, you know, th this is a patient of mine, young person, uh, who contracted COVID, confirmed COVID in the spring of 2020. And she had a terrible case, terrible, terrible case. And she had a very rare underlying condition. She had something called idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And she is one of one patient that I have with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. You know, this is an uncommon condition. So her underlying condition had been quiescent for years, but in the setting of COVID, it provoked these terrible daily headaches for weeks and weeks and weeks. And mm -hmm. if you can imagine in April of 2020, trying to get somebody in for a neurology visit was, you know, pretty right. much impossible. So she was suffering through this, ultimately had to get a lumbar puncture to address that underlying condition, headache resolved. Uh, and then she was fine. And and so uh, this individual works at a uh, academic medical center, not not my academic medical, medical center, but there's a lot in New York City, uh, a non-clinician, but a patient facing role and was was mandated to get the vaccine and asked me for a vaccine exemption letter because she said, listen, I had COVID, it was terrible. I've got immunity. People say I've got immunity and I'm scared that if I get this vaccine, it's gonna I'll kick- get the headache. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna kick up that idiopathic intracranial hypertension and I'm gonna have to have a headache and an LP and it's gonna be a mess. And I said, I think you'll be fine, but I don't know, you know, you're one of, one patient I have who, who's had this, you had a bizarro com complication from COVID. You've got a very rare condition. You've got probably more robust immunity than anybody who's been vaccinated. It seems reasonable to me. And so me as her primary care doctor wrote an exemption and it was declined, denied. And I just thought, this is, this is, this is zealotry. This is not, um, you know, I understand that we want to get as many people vaccinated as possible, but, um, uh, but when you pursue a goal uh, without any uh, concern for, uh, you know, collateral damage, I think it's uh, it was just a little bit overzealous. And so that started to make me feel like a lot of this was um, and I think you've you've mentioned this, that a, a lot of the push for the vaccine was, you know, not just that it was an effective vaccine and we were a pandemic. And of course, this was all necessary, but it was there was it was tinged with politics, which to me was was always very strange. Uh, that's so well said. So, you know, and I think listeners of my show are gonna be angry and they're gonna be in the comments saying all this stuff. But here's what I wanna point out. This is where we're all gonna be in agreement. One, uh, natural immunity should have been treated differently. You say that, I say that. I think the people who watch this channel will agree. I think that's absolutely the case. I mean, I think we did have good evidence that you had a good amount of immunity and as you point out, no one knew how long the vaccine would last. And more importantly, no one ever had randomized evidence that if you had the infection and got better and you got the vaccine, you were somehow better off than if you hadn't. I mean, that's really the gold standard and they don't have that evidence. That's a good point. The second point, who decides what the exemptions are? I mean, for a while they said if a boy got the first dose and had pericarditis, 
go ahead and give dose two. I mean, that was, that is a, I mean, really? For a 16 year old, you were gonna push him dose two? You have pericarditis, you wanna take, you wanna roll that dice? Uh -huh. That to me, but, but that's crazy. Because um, it's just Perry, it's not Mayo. Just it's not Perry. Mayo, yeah. It's not, the, it's, not the, it's not the free wall, you know? It's just, uh -huh. it's just a sack, it's just a sack. And you know, and now, sack. even three doses in a boy and they just had Omicron and they're not giving the exemption at these crazy colleges. We'll talk about that. Okay, yes. now, but the one thing I do wanna say is, you know, um, Paul makes a really astute point, which is that a prerequisite to have a mandate is that you have to believe there's benefit to third parties. And I think it was reasonable to believe that. I was still opposed to the mandate. I just want to say why I was opposed at the time, because one, I know like Americans, you know, and, and I like, you know, I just know Americans don't like to be told what to do. And the yes. moment you start telling them what to do, you only get like, you know, four of those cards in your life to tell an American what to do. Yes. And if you play the card and you turn out to be mm -hmm. wrong, as they did, or if you play the card and it's incredibly politically divisive, as it was, yes. you know, I worry about the backlash. And the backlash is going to be people may vote differently for decades, and that may have spillover effects on childhood nutrition, this, mm -hmm. that, and the other. And then I also worried about, um, you know, uh, pushing people out of the workforce. And those people are dangerous. I mean, they're not dis yes. they're dangerous to themselves and to others because yes. the more you displace people. So I was, I was, I was against it. But I, I want listeners to know that, um, you know, this is this is the middle ground. I mean, reasonable people could have reasonable disagreements about this. Um, uh, but now things shifted. Let's talk about the second the second half of it. This is where I think, you know, it's harder to defend what what the zealots are doing. Now it's the summer 2021. Breakthroughs are becoming more and more common. Now we move to Omicron and escape is is not just uh is it, can you have an escape? It's when will you get your escape? When will you get breakthrough infection? Um, and now we're moving past initial vaccination and we're moving into the third, fourth, and fifth dose. So talk a little bit about how you feel about the mandates now and about the fall booster campaign. Yeah, so I, uh, um, you know, I already had this reticent that, um, that I expressed to you. And, you know, and, 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 and I'll say just as an aside, um, I didn't, I, I didn't want to put any of this residence reticence into that essay that I wrote because I did think, and maybe we'll talk about this later. I did think it was important to write a letter that was uh, an apology that did not didn't have asterisks about you know I, I apologize for having supported something that turned out to be wrong, but I was never into you know this, and I always thought natural immunity, and it, it just sort of waters down the messaging of. Uh, you know, I made a decision based on this assumption. This assumption was clearly not true. If it was true, it was true for a very short period of time. And, and so it was the wrong decision. Um, but yeah, o Omicron came through. And, you know, I wrote in that article that you, you could see it hit um, uh, Europe. And uh, Portugal in particular was a highly vaccinated. I think it was the most highly vaccinated country in Europe. Right. And it, and it just poured through the country. Right. It poured through the country. And, and so clearly, this was not detaining the wave of infection. And, you know, and there's a lot of people. Uh, so I had submitted this essay to another um, sort of more mainstream news bureau. And, 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 and they said no. And the editor wrote back and said, you know, and actually this, this idea that um, vaccines don't stop uh, infection is, is on shaky grounds and pointed me to, you know, there was a study of prisoners. And, 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 and I was just like, you, you are so missing the point. If, you know, even if the vaccine reduces the R naught from like 3.2 to 3.1, it's not having a clinically meaningful and certainly not a socially meaningful impact to justify forcing someone to take an intervention against their will. And, and, and the stretch between the rhetoric, right? The rhetoric before right. was, you know, you're going to kill grandma. Right. And, you know, and then a couple of months later, you know, a bunch of vaccinated, triple vax people were giving it to grandma. And so, um, you know, that's such a great point. And I think this gets lost. People say that, um, oh, you know, it's incorrect that the vaccine doesn't dampen transmission. It does dampen it. Well, yeah, maybe, but it dampens it transiently. OK, that's one fact, because vaccine effectiveness over time goes back to the null. And two, modestly. And a modest dampening would be fine for something that might only come across your plate once every few years. Okay, but if you're going to be meeting SARS-CoV-2 every minute of the day, <laughs> a modest dampening, you know, like I like to tell people, if you made me play Russian roulette and you put one bullet in the gun, 
I'm a whole lot happier than if you made me play with four bullets, okay? Four bullets, I'm nervous. But if you make me play every 10 minutes for the whole day, four mm -hmm. bullets, one bullet, we all know how that game ends, okay? I don't want to play, right? And that's what they're saying, right? Your point is the yes. R-naught is changing modestly, but you have to keep going out there every day. You're going to get COVID. So why are yes. we for, yeah, right. So that's the question, right? Yes. And and, and again, it's 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 one thing for someone to take this decision upon themselves, right? For someone to say, I, well, I understand that there's a transient, modest, decreased transmission. Right. Uh, for me, that's good enough for me to get the vaccine, you know, maybe because I visit my elderly parents. Right. Them, fine. Right. Make that, make that decision yourself. Right. But but that's not justification for uh, for mandating against somebody's uh, against somebody's will and or shaming them that they didn't get the vaccine because of this very modest transient effect that really is not going to affect the, the kinetics of this pandemic in any meaningful way. And I completely agree. And um, and to me, the, bizarre, the most bizarre thing now is we're watching where the places that exert the mandates are places that have power and not places that make sense. Most healthcare workers are exempt from mandates, but 20-year-old college students at Smith and Yale and Columbia are subject to the most mandates. Yes, they're, yeah. they're, they're the least risk and they're the least risk to spread yeah, it no. to anyone at high risk. Yeah. What sense is this? Yeah. No, that's, that's, it's sheer insanity and it's, it's an abuse of power, honestly. And that's what I think. I think it's an abuse of power. And, um, and to your further point, which is that saying what you're saying now, the, 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 the one side actually says that that you, what you're saying is anti-vax. And I say to myself, what are you talking? There's a doctor who's practiced for 15 years. He's pro-medical therapies when they're useful and valuable. And what he's saying is medical facts. That's what he's saying. Now, I mean, to, to, to say that's anti-vax is, is so absurd. Like I um, recommend statins to my patients who uh, have high risk of, you know, for primary prevention who, who have high cardiovascular risk. Um, it's a reasonable... Uh, intervention to offer and it's a reasonable intervention to accept but i would never mandate that except that, that that intervention and to mandate uh, a statin to someone who's you know 10-year cardiovascular risk score is 20 percent would be to me insane it's not appropriate you know uh I, yeah and this is this is the equivalent of mandating the statin to the 20 year old in college it's actually yes. like that yeah <laughs> right you're mandating it to the 20 year old in college you wouldn't even want to maybe you wouldn't want to give it to them and now we're yes. mandating it yeah um, direct observe therapy, or he's not going to get to enroll. Um, you know, so what I really liked about your essay is that it, it gives people space to acknowledge that when the facts change materially, yes. that your policy can change materially. Yes, yes. And I think that that's really important. And I, and I hear what you're saying now, which is that your essay never mentioned your thoughts on natural immunity, et cetera. But to some degree, it was good that it didn't mention it because it actually gave more space for a dialogue. Yeah, that's no, 100%. That, yeah. Paul Fineves, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and get your thoughts on all these COVID-19 policy issues. Uh, you're a true centrist, and I think it's important for people to be centrist and try to reconcile these warring halves. Your thoughts on amnesty versus accountability, I'd love for you to write that up and send it to Sensible Medicine. Um, thank you so much for doing this, sir. Sure. Vinay, thank you so much for your time and, and for listening. I appreciate it.